Okay, so that's us live. Um, so good morning and welcome everybody to the second day of Manchester in Translation, organised by Comma Press. Um, this is a virtual conference aimed at aspiring translators um, in the north of England, but also everywhere. So welcome. Um, so today we're going to be diving into the relationship between the publisher and the translator, how you will work together. Um, and we've got a fantastic panel of experts to help us kind of walk us through that process. So that's from the pitch, the importance of the pitch, which I'm sure we'll all have lots to say on um, the publication and then through to promoting and publicizing the book as well at the end. Um, so we're going to try and cram in as much practical advice as possible. And I know that some of the panelists have some resources to share with you all as well at the end. Um, but if you've got any questions or any queries or something's unclear, then as always, just feel free to type type in the chat on YouTube and we'll try after about 45 minutes of conversation, we'll come back and try and go through as many as we can at the end of the session. Um, so to kick things off, I'm going to do some short introductions and then ask the panelists to then introduce themselves again <laughs> um, in more detail. Um, but just so they could tell us a little bit about what they're doing now and kind of how, how, they, got, um, how they got there. Um, so first we have the very wonderful Sophie Hughes, who I'm sure many of you know. She is a literary critic, editor um, trans and translator from Spanish um, to English. She was shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize for the remainder. So we're very lucky to have her um, with us um, because she's essentially, I think, translation royalty now. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> Absolutely how it works. <laughs> um, and also Nicholas Smalley. Um, so she is on the panel occupying two roles for us today um, because she's a fantastic translator from Norwegian and Swedish, but also she works at, as a publicist at And Other Stories, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with or you will be by the end of this session. And last but not least, we've got Paul Engels. Um, he is has been working in editorial at the mighty McElhose Press for over 10 years now, I calculated. Um, so yes, I'm sure he'll have lots and lots to say about the process. Um, so I shall pass it over to Sophie first, um, just for a little introduction, if you can. Yes, thank, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm a literary translator, that's my main job. Uh, I do do some uh, review writing as well, a little bit less now than I used to. Uh, and I do do some editing. So the last thing I edited was with Comma Press, actually. Um, and but yeah, my main my main uh, position is as a literary translator. I don't do any other kind of translation, uh, which many other translators do, uh, and that can be a, a kind of kind of earn you a bit more of a solid living uh, sometimes. But maybe we'll come on to that later. Um, but yeah, uh, literary translations, what I love, I studied English at university, I didn't study languages, I learned my languages a bit later, um, and then did uh, some further studies, higher, um, like a, a master's in comparative literature, where I sort of first begun to understand that such a thing happened, you know, that, lit that, tra that books were translated, which I don't think is all that uncommon. I think that often, you know, we, it, it's the um, example that always gets used, but like, you know, you reading Dostoevsky you're not necessarily you're not just reading him you know you're reading whoever his words have passed through to get into English so um, that's where I found out what that was and then I worked in publishing for a bit um, I think I'll maybe talk about that when you ask us about our books the first books that we did and stuff and then um, and then gradually yeah I've just got got more and more more and more work so um, that's me is that enough for now is that absolutely yes <laughs> Nikki, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Um, so I'm Nikki Smalley um, and I had a long convoluted route into translation, but um, I also didn't study languages initially. Um, I lived in Berlin for a little while when I was 21 and learned German. And then um, I decided to come back to the UK and study um, Swedish actually. Um, don't, there's no real reason why I did that, I uh, just liked it, um, and um, when I was studying I started doing odd bits of translation for friends um, very badly initially, and then realised that this was a really fun thing to do, so um, 
I then did a PhD and the PhD was related to translation, um, but it wasn't all about translation. But during the time that I was doing PhD, I came into contact with lots of people um, in Sweden and in the UK who were involved in the translation world. Um, and that got me a few jobs doing um, sample translations for Swedish agents. So Swedish literary agents commissioned me to translate a short, you know, 50 pages or whatever of a book. And one of those got picked up and published. And that was my first uh, proper book translation. I'd done some work for literary magazines as well. Um, and then when I finished my PhD, I realized I didn't want to be an academic. And then I got the job at And Other Stories, which was a great, a great thing to do actually, because it taught me before I'd really become a translator, it taught me about how the literary world works in a way that I don't think I could have. Personally, I couldn't have learned about the way the literary world works unless I had done that job because I was kind of outside, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have that easier way into that understanding. Um, and now I have published about six books, I think, I lose track. Um, and I've got maybe seven, uh, anyway. Um, and I don't, I, I still work for Another Stories, I'm part-time, I have one day a week when I translate, so translation doesn't pay my bills, um, but combined with uh, my work for Another Stories, it's a, it's a, an acceptable income. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. <laughs> um, but I can't believe you almost forgot one of your books there, that's terrible, one of your, the book, your translation babies. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm... <laughs> It's fine. Yeah. Um, so, Paul, would we be able to move on to you as well, how you kind of found yourself working in literature and translation? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, when I was younger, I kind of exclusively read Star Wars novels and Red War. And then at some point I woke up, and I was suddenly extremely pretentious and wanted to read French books and translation and watch French films and stuff like that. Not really sure why. And that kind of um, went on to university a bit. And then after university, I worked at John Sando Books in Chelsea, where the, one of the owners was very, very close to the Harvard Press. He was published by them at some point. So we had a kind of Harvard Press spinner, and there was quite a lot of short novels in translation that were recommended to customers. So I kind of got into reading that kind of thing. And then when I went on to do an MA in publishing at LCC, London College of Communication, um, I did my dissertation on translated fiction, I was trying to, I was looking at whether um, translated crime fiction, that was kind of like 2008, so it was just around the time Stieg Larsson was, was um, being published, um, whether uh, translated crime fiction was going to push literary fiction out of the, um, of, of the translation sphere, because there was more money in, in doing, in doing crime novels. Um, so among the people I interviewed for that um, was Christopher Lackahose. I kind of sent him an email, I think, and then got back an answer with everything in capitals, which was a bit difficult to deal with. Um, <laughs> and then I think subsequently I met him at a launch for one of his authors who was also a customer of the bookshop. And my friend made me speak to him and say, oh, you helped me. And now I finished my dissertation. And um, he asked me to send his CV. And a couple of months later, Katharina, Biedenberg invited me for an interview, sort of an interview. It was a, more of a chat in the LRB cafe where Christopher talked about going down the Nile with, um, I can't remember, Peter Matheson somewhere else. Somewhere else. And then I said, I have to go because I need to catch a flight. So, and then a couple of days later, they said, we want you to come and work part time with us. So I started doing that as kind of a publishing assistant kind of thing. Um, and then it just snowballed from there. First, I was part time in book selling and part time publishing and then full-time publishing and I've just sort of never never left um started doing more and more editorial work and getting to the swing of it and um I'm, I'm still here so that's basically my story that's great so far <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought we might actually start from the publishing perspective um in terms of with you Paul and and um, McElhose um 
how how books get to you just in terms of what you decide to kind of take on and um, what's the route to to be published by Macklehose? Well let's see I mean it's there's quite a few different strands I mean I have to say authors who have been published because because kind of Christopher's publishing he's now left Macklehose Press um, but his publishing goes back quite a long way with author translation so quite a lot of authors that he had published before. In terms of the new ones, I'd say we definitely have taken on um, books where the translator has pitched it, or um, there was a recent one, I think, um, I can't remember the name of the author, but the, the title is Where the Queen Falls Asleep, and that was a book that came through a translator's pitch. Um, another one was uh, The Presence Gardens, which uh, by Musin Al Ramni, which Luke Leifgren uh, translated and that came to me via um, I think I spoke to um, Marcia Links Quayley about that because I saw it was on a, a prize short, long list but a lot of the books come through agents um, and probably more so foreign publishers um, so it, it's, it's something we always we do read and receive translators pitches but I'd say that's probably about maybe five percent of what we end up doing is through that route it's mostly through uh, it's mostly through foreign publishers or agents and it might be a case of or if we see that uh, a book has been picked up by a few different houses like BTB or Gallimard or um, Einaudi or something like that that kind of because there's kind of there's a certain number of European houses that we kind of align ourselves with over the last decade of publishing so there's quite a lot of books that um, that come that we get kind of through those recommendations um, and also publishers that, that know your list quite well so yeah so it's like people it's kind of a lot of it comes out on the editor like editors who've known each other for for a long time will speak at frankfurt and say do you know about this book um with publishing it it's really good and it kind of it spreads that way or, or through scout sometimes um we do you, do you use scout so could you explain what um what a scout is yeah of course um so a mystery scout is that kind of mysterious third, fourth set of publishing where um, usually they are paid by a publisher or a retainer and so they read things and recommend them so there's not so much, it's not so much commission based and they don't have any interest in the book itself but they kind of they they read a lot of books and got, they have got staff who read in different languages and they and they also it also works for the film industry as well so they're, they're not agents they're not publishers they're some, somewhere in between and they're kind of I don't know, people like I guess because they're called scouts they sound like the most mysterious and and cool people in publishing yeah, um so well, to get it on record what they were <laughs> yeah, <I know>. yeah. <laughs> they are so mysterious yeah. but just in terms of kind of the different jobs there are around kind of um literary translation I think that yeah and yeah. I would can I just jump in there and as the yeah. translator side of that I would I would say that um scouts are often the forgotten kind of entry um, for translators too, because we often talk about sort of being in contact with agents and being knowing knowing uh, publishers lists and uh, being voracious readers but you can get paid to read as well and I worked as a literary scout for as a you know I worked as the Spanish reader for a big literary scout an international literary scout um, for, for a number of years and really knocked out a lot of reading and reports mm -hmm. uh, many of which I mean a, a number of which ended up being books that I translated as well. So it really is, um, it really is a good way in. Can I ask you a question you about that actually? Book? Can I ask you a question about that, Sophie? Yeah, Which sorry, is... and I'm, I'm sorry, because I've interrupted Paul's, Paul's bit as well. I just, want, I, I just wondered how you, um, how you read quickly enough to, for that to make enough money for you. Like I did a couple of reports for Scouts and I found that, you know, Sorry, we're really getting into the specifics here, but it was like forty pounds or something they were offering me, and I was like, I can't skim read. I can't even skim read this quick enough to make it kind of. So um, I off I was I was paid double that for a regular report. Mm. More than that, this is about five years ago. More than that for a longer report. So that's one answer. Uh, I read. I didn't sleep around fair time. <laughs> you know, I really, really, really read and read and read and read, um, which is why I don't do it anymore, because I couldn't do that anymore, because my life has changed around me. But um, uh, and the other thing was, is that this particular scout needed 
also a person to help with admin and paid me well because also she was aware that the turnaround was exhausting for her because she'd have to train up more readers so she just wanted someone to stay so she paid me well yeah is that something that you two as translators kind of still do in terms of sample readers reports or publishers if there's a project that you come across that you think needs to be put into the hands of a certain publisher I get asked to do readers reports quite often um I haven't done any for a couple for a year or so partly because I've been really busy and partly for the same reasons as Sophie my life has changed and it's not um it's not really an option anymore but readers reports doing readers reports has that's got me work in the past actually I've translated books off the back of readers reports so even though I was only paid 80 or 100 pounds for it um mm. it led to a it led to a full book translation and it is it's a good way to build a relationship with publishers I would say because they learn to you know if you can show that you can read in a way that understands to some degree you know that like if you're a critical interesting critical reader who can get inside a book that's really valuable for you know a publisher to have those kind of readers Absolutely. What else is kind of expected from a readers report? If you were to enable um, able to kind of to enter into that kind of pool of readers for a certain publisher, or to join one of, I think, under the stories runs reading groups as well. Um, um, yes, uh, we do run reading reading groups, and that is a slightly uh, so so it's almost like instead of getting. A readers report will we have like a community of readers who read a book together and there are various different reasons that we do that partly it's because we like to hear from you know sometimes you get a readers report from somebody but you want to have a wide a wider perspective sometimes it's because it you know we just love having conversations with people about books and you get all kinds of different inputs into that through the reading groups um sometimes it's because it helps us to you know if if a reading group has really loved a, a particular book that we end up publishing there's already a kind of swell of excitement about that book that can help the book on its way into into english um, it's also brought us into contact with a lot of translators that many many of whom have ended up working for us Fantastic. Translating books. And is this something that you're commissioning as well quite a lot, Paul? If you said the, the kind of the most obvious route for you to um, take on a translation project is via book fair, so people pitching different books to you. Um, do you use quite a big network of readers as well for your reports? Um, we sort of historically have had, it's been quite a small network actually, so the, the idea has been kind of to have the same readers uh, stay with us for a long time so they kind of get to know the taste of the press and it's and they, they kind of almost and we have a lot of particular Spanish readers um, particular Italian and then also a lot of the time our translators become become readers as well so um, also we're quite we tend to use the same translators quite often um, that might be something that will change uh, in the future we might become a bit more um, spread our arms a bit wider to the to emerging translators but we tend to use a relatively experienced pool so far um, and so we they often have quite a, a large impact input on whether they want to translate a book or whether it, it gets bought I suppose there's there's kind of two different ways a book is bought it's either bought sort of like quite slowly in the you know the books out there it's not not someone that not something there's huge excitement for but we think it's interesting we think it fits the list it gets a couple of good reports and then it comes through or it's something that you have to jump on that three or four or five publishers might be interested in you have to do um the kind of, you have to do a marketing plan and all that and and it's a bit of a bidding war so it's kind of like it's, there's two different ways um so things can either be quite sedate and <laughs> quite frustrating it will take quite a long time or a bit of a whirlwind and then and, and I suppose because we're part of a big five publisher, um, mm. uh, we're part of, Michael Hess Press is part of Quercus, which is part of Hachette, um, which is the second biggest publisher in the UK. Um, 
a lot of the way books are published in a large publisher is um, that the a book that comes with a lot of hype that lots of publishers have been interested in buying often kind of has um, in the same way that the, the reading group maybe on a bigger scale gives a book impetus when it goes into the market it's the same way with these very big um, coveted books so that that method kind of fits quite well into into the environment we're in in terms of buying something that we can kind of put something in the book set and say this is going to be the huge bestseller of this year albeit it's translated from Norwegian, Dutch or French or whatever. I think um, Aaron Arva said yesterday in, um, during our keynote speech about how when you're pitching often to publishers um, it can really really help if you love the book um, but I was just wondering if you could talk me through Sophie maybe first in terms of your your history of pitching, how, what is it? Yeah, <laughs> um, how is it? To go back. <laughs> um, how, um, how, how do you pitch? And also, do you, do you think it has to be a book that you love or is it something that you found the kind of, the commercial potential in something and you know that will fit, um, fit with a certain pu um, publisher? Um, what's, um, what would people need to know in terms of before they start on that journey? Um, We'll see what Nikki, whether Nikki agrees, but, for, but as a translator, I would only pitch a book that I loved. I wouldn't, I sort of, I don't think I've ever heard of a translator pitching a book that they don't love um, or, or really are, or for some reason are really keen to translate. Uh, the reason being, um, of course, you get, you get work that way by pitching, but, um, you know, you're, you're not an agent. There is, there is a difference. So for the, for the, purposes of explaining to the room what pitching a book means. It means that an author has either in a, in a foreign language published a book and you happen to have read it because you speak that language and you really like it and therefore you would like the book to find its way into English translation. Um, to, in order to do that, from the translator's point of view, um, you need to, in some way, uh, describe what the book is. You need to find out, importantly, what the right situation is. So whether that author is, whether their rights are represented by a publisher in that foreign language, or whether they're represented by the eight by the agent of the author. In Latin America, lots of authors still don't have agents. That's beginning to change now. But you know understanding, as Nikki said earlier, the nuts and bolts of how the, the machine works is so important. And I've said this since I began, and that is because I also began working in a literary agency. So like Nikki, not, you've got the publisher's perspective, but from an agency perspective, you simply learn how books went through, uh, you know, went through the factory and, and, and came out the other end. And you understood book rights and uh, there are, there are loads of resources for anyone listening um, to go into more detail about that because I'd probably spend an hour talking about just what, what book rights are. But basically, essentially, in order to pitch a book to a UK publisher and be in contact with them and say, I really think that you should take a look at this excellent book from, um, uh, from the Swedish, you need to make sure that that book is available for you to be pitching in the first place. What by that I mean that the rights have not been sold to another publisher and that the work is going on because that will cause you heartache and you will have wasted your time um, and you'll be wasting publishers time and almost because of what Paul mentioned earlier you know a lot of publishers still don't really rely on translate well they don't certainly don't rely on translators but they're not as keen maybe or, or, or receptive to translators pitches as to agents pitches or to publishing houses pitches which is understandable because you are not really known to them you're sort of an unknown entity and if you go in your first instance and you sort of represent yourself as loving literature and loving books but not really understanding how it works. And if you sort of waste their time essentially by saying this wonderful book, but it's not even available for them to, to publish, then it doesn't, it doesn't sort of put, like put, you know, shed you in the greatest light, I suppose. Um, uh, so, so a book, so what you do essentially is write why you think that book uh, would work in English why you love it is a really good place to start in a pitch why you loved reading it the feeling that it gave you in the same way that a good book review 
will um, impart on you a, the feeling that you get when reading the book, not just the synopsis of it, the excitement, the environment, the atmosphere of it. If you can do that for a publisher, but also show, and this is really important, so this is what marks it out from a kind of literary essay that you might have done in your degree or you know A-level, uh, but also show kind of comp titles, so other books that maybe are comparable to it so the book so the publisher might be able to say oh, okay I kind of beginning to get the feel of this book um or where it might fit also showing the publisher I mean Paul answer but, uh, like butt in certainly but like showing them that in some way you've understood their list that you are that you are familiar with what they publish because again another way of and kind of slightly wasting people's time is just pitching the wrong book to the wrong person um a great book it may be but it just might not fit on that person's list I'm doing a book report at the moment and one of the things that's in my mind as I read the book now I know I like it and actually I know I'd like to translate it so I'm going to be able to be honest about that but I'm not sure it's 100% right for the publisher that I'm that I'm writing the report for so it's those nuances that that really matter um, because it it's it's an investment on the part of the publisher. I mean, every book that they buy is an investment, but they have to put up money to translate books. So it's quite hard to convince some publishers. I wonder if maybe publishers are slightly reluctant or wary of translators' pitches because there might be some idea in the back of their heads that the translators might be in it more for the love of the book and it being, you know, a, a good book, a good, I mean, an interesting literary language, and they kind of feel have an unconscious bias that it's not going to be something that's going to be commercial or work that translators kind of are more rarefied than the average reader so the book that a translator would like is going to find um is not going to find any readers and I think maybe some maybe some translators have internalized this in that I mean I remember Margaret Joel Costa writing say all the books I like tend to be the ones that no one would want to read sort of thing <laughs> um but in in terms of books where I mean I think the the best example of a book where a translator has pitched and it's gone well for everyone involved is the vegetarian um, author name, I can't remember actually, but Deborah Smith, <laughs> which Deborah Kang. Smith translated yeah. Tan Kang. So um, I met Deborah for the first time in London Book Fair many years ago, and she mentioned this book and then and sent a sample of it. And I think it previously the agent had tried to sell it and not had any luck. And so I received this, I was, and I sort of, I was quite new in the job and the idea of a Kore of Korean book sounded like unbelievably um, rare and fantastical. Um, so I, I did read it and I got back to her, but unfortunately by that time, I think Max Porter had jumped on it the very next day. So <laughs> she said, you can be the backup publisher um, because that they want to take it forward. So I left it at that. And then um, a couple of years later, it was huge and won the International Booker Prize. So that's that's something where it, it can definitely work, and and obviously that's that's was the um, was the acorn that that decision for Deborah to champion that book seems to be the acorn that launched the tree the tree that is Tilted Axis Press, the publisher she said set up subsequently. Um, and so note about Deborah is that she was very strategic in choosing Korean. Um, you know she's she's a translator who's political and and I say that you know in, a, in an extremely positive way um she is is trying to um kind of amplify re the representation of of languages that traditionally have not been you know precisely what Paul said it's, it felt like something kind of almost fantastical the idea of translating a Korean book hopefully we are slowly moving towards that not being the case but it, but what you said before Paul about people also it has to be with a commercial you know you have to have your commercial head on too um, and, and Deborah in choosing Korean as the language that she would go and learn in order to become a literary translation is another really good example of that. Hmm. And it's, it's interesting that was the, the agent, I think Barbara, Barbara Zitt was the agent, was also um, at the same time kind of looking at Korea, perhaps, perhaps less. Um, so it's interesting that two, two, two figures in different kind of literary figures both kind of came together in that in that in kind of that um exposing of such a, a rich um literary market that has um so many gems that we've gone on to discover um another example of a trans something that in from my experience um is the Jin Yong's Jin Yong's novels Jin Yong is a hugely um 
best-selling Chinese author of martial arts novels, and Anna Holmwood, she, I don't, we were sent the book by an agent, and I'm not entirely, I, I don't know quite exactly how Anna became attached to the book, but the book came with a sample translation and kind of a translation strategy that Anna came up with. And I don't know whether she pitched it to the agent or the agent found I, her. Was it that Anna was working for, was it, um, what are they called, Great? No, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't great. It was um, Peter Buckman, the Amazon oh, okay. agency, who, okay. who, who were his agent. And he said that, I mean, I think he found it by typing in famous Chinese novels into Google. So, <laughs> but, it, but part of the reason we decided to embark on this project, which, by the way, we finally, we, trans, we, we took on, not quite knowing it, we took on 12 books, each of 400 pages. And we've now just translated four of them. Um, and it's taken about, I think, seven five or seven years to do that. Um, it's a wonderful project and they're, and they're brilliant books, but part of the reason we took on such a big thing was because we, we wasn't an author to meet. I mean, he was still alive then, but he was 97 and not really going out of his house very much. But um, part of it was the, the huge success the books had had, but part of it was the energy that Anna brought to the project. And when we met her, she was just a ball of, of energy and enthusiasm and could talk, could, could talk a million miles an hour. Um, about about these books and she, and so that kind of that gave us the confidence to go with this and that she would be the perfect translator so that's another example of where um the translators kind of felt uh critical and essential part of, of the project that's good to know and is nikki is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of obviously the enthusiasm there and, and lots of research in terms of placing it with the right publisher but is there anything else you think is good to go armed with just in terms of knowing more maybe about the funding that would be available for a certain project or just kind of like how important is the kind of the additional information that you can get your hands on like do book sales help what what helps um, um so definitely i don't know about book sales necessarily i think it varies a lot from you know it varies so much from publisher to publisher wh whether they're concerned about that kind of thing I mean obviously we don't and and other stories we're not going to take on a book that sold two copies um, mm -hmm. and you know has like been read by nobody um, often books that come to us have been critically acclaimed in the country of origin um, or maybe country of origin is maybe the wrong thing to say but you know the, the original language edition and maybe they've been critically acclaimed across Europe or a range of different countries um, they might have been translated into several different languages before they come to us before they reach English um, but there's no it's really hard because there's no tried and tested um, formula you know for what for what is going to make a book work in English, and I think I think I think to remember is we don't, you know, that nobody nobody knows exactly what, yeah, what what is going to work. Um, but that excitement, I mean, it really it really does come down to to the excitement and like whether whether you get a sense talking to a person that this book has changed them in some way or that this book has, you know, that, that, that there's something about the voice in the book. Like that's something that we think about a lot as a publisher is, is you know, we, we publish primarily um, literary fiction that is, um, you know, we're probably less commercially minded than Matt Clowes, uh, for instance. Um, partly we're, Arts Council funded so although our books do need to sell you know we do want to sell a few thousand copies of our books we can get away with publishing some books that don't quite achieve that um, and we also have a subscription uh, scheme which means that when a book when we choose a book as a subscriber book it sells a thousand copies before it's even been published because we have about, you know, a thousand subscribers will receive that book. Um, but yeah, for us, the most important thing is, is does this book feel vital in some way? Is it saying something new? Is it doing something new? You know, is it doing something new in formally or 
does it feel like something that we haven't read before is the voice does the voice stand out um and that's really difficult to quantify i can't tell you exactly what voice is it's just an indefinable quality I thought you're going to use your hands there um, but so for, <laughs> um i know that you're talking about various kind of resources because we'll, we'll need to move on to kind of what happens once the kind of once the book's actually been signed because i know that you were talking before about you could talk forever about rights because um there's there is kind of a lot that the translator sometimes needs to know but also there's lots of other places you can go and get support and advice from when you get to contract stage and um, but you're also talking about some resources that kind of map that journey as well in terms of to publication or the different publishing houses that um that are currently exist that are open to submissions or kind of what they publish because i think yeah all of us know that, that research really is key um as yeah part of this. Um, exactly. So for anyone who's an aspirational translator listening, um, and actually if there are any more established translators listening as well, and you don't know about it, you should, you should know um, about the Literary Translation Database, which was um, set up brilliantly by Charlotte Coombe, but is also a kind of collaborative resource. So it's, um, that's what she calls it, this collaborative resource. So it's an open Google Doc, which I think you guys are, are putting into the comments um, now. Um, and there's also online in the National Centre for Writing, you can find an article about why um, Charlotte Coombe started this database, but it has different tabs, including uh, opportunities for grants, uh, where which, lit which literary journals will um, accept uh, submissions in translation or actually are looking actively for those. Uh, and most relevantly to what we've been talking about just now, um, to, to, in order to gain kind of um, a, a great wider perspective than just us three talking you there is a tab in which many translators describe how one of their books not always their first book how one of their books came to be published sort of came, came, came to be um like yeah accepted and and they got they got the contract in order to to be the translator so that's a re really recent and up to constantly updated resource for anyone sitting here thinking but i just don't really understand how I could ever gain access to a publisher. And, and, and one last little tip that I think is really important is to remember that translators are work, should work, should be on an even playing field to other people in this big translation machine. You don't need to think that you're on the back foot or that you're bothering someone. You know, you, you are an expert in your field. You have a, a, a uh, you are you are a reader like the editor that you're writing to but you also in many in many instances have a skill that they just don't have which is learn which is speaking the other language um so so to sort of remember that and remember that you're both professionals and that it's not a sort of you know it's not a matter of kind of going and begging for work it's they want what you've got so you know go go with confidence um go informed go with confidence and go with passion and uh and I think that will that will you'll you'll go far. So in terms of the timeline, <laughs> can I also say? Sorry, I just put myself on mute. Yeah. But can I just say one more thing about resources? Um, on um, the end of the stories website, I'm going to put the link in a chat. In the chat, there's a a PDF um, that uh, Roz Schwartz put together. She's a translator from French who's very very established and has been working. She's worked for all of the big publishers. I don't know. Has she done books for Maclose? I'm not sure. Um, and <laughs> she's an authority yeah, anyway. Recall, so. She put together yeah, a absolutely. list, like a checklist, basically, of like how to put together a pitch, how to write a translation proposal. And it's really, really great. Um, and it's you can download the PDF um, from our website. So I'm just going to put that. Uh, oh, should I put it in the chat, or are you going to combine resources afterwards? I'm not sure. Um, if you if you put it in the chat, then we can share it onto YouTube as well. Okay, so cool. Right. She's also there. done a YouTube video of that same talk, so she's done has done herself talking about like you know presenting on YouTube and is on the Translators Allowed Network. But no one should go and visit that now while we're still speaking. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear about that. Um, so once you've kind of once you have signed a contract with the publisher, um, what does it look like? What are the timelines like? Who are you mainly working with in that organisation? What's your relationship like with the author? Is it um, you know it could would anyone like to start in terms of 
yeah, what what the map to actually get the publication looks like, what the route does. Sorry. Anyone? Can I say that it varies massively from wildly? And you can that, yeah, <laughs> just in terms um, of because um, obviously it's like it changes from project to project. Yeah, and just in terms of what people are to expect, kind of their involvement and in um, either, you know, whilst they're doing the translation, but also once you submit as well, it would be great yeah. to get a little bit of insight into that. So, um, I think it's sort of... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Nicola. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just from the... Well, years, well, I, mean, there's, I guess there's, there's two stages to the editing usually. There's a kind of, or maybe three stages. Um, there'll be a kind of a line edit from the acquiring or the editor who's working on the book. And then there might be a copy editor, a copy edit from an external copy editor, um, someone like a freelancer. Those two stages might be combined into one, so the, ed the editor might do all of it. Either the internal editor might do everything in terms of. So that can't be. I mean, there might be that might be a close reading of the text if the editor reads the other language. It might be more of an edit that. Uh, sort of tries to a certain extent to shift the language of the originals slightly into something more that would kind of suit the target language. I think that would be particularly more in commercial books where the plot is more important than the language like crime thrillers and stuff like that. There might even be a certain amount of structural editing, perhaps cuts to the text. Uh, and sometimes that can be kind of a complicated process involving author and agent. Sometimes that can be something that comes up before the book, there's a negotiation before the book is even acquired. So that sort of thing can happen. It's not that it's not that common, but it's something that we've done on books. We've done a little bit on books recently. It tend, again, that tends to be more on plot-driven crime sort of novels that are expected to kind of bring in a fair bit of revenue. So, um, and then after that, the books are typeset, put into proofs, and then there's a proofreading stage, and the translator is normally allowed to. Um, make corrections quite sometimes translators do a lot of corrections at that stage there are a lot of publishers that, that discourage that it kind of depends on whether the, the publisher is paying the flat rate for the for the typesetting or they're paying per correction so some and it's, it's the same with author correction some publishers will push back on that so that's that's basically the stages of editing um and at, at some point during that the cover is designed the copy is written so quite often i i will have engagement with the the translation on both of those um, things. Um, normally, and, and also I think the, the relationship the editors have with the author varies. Sometimes, there's sometimes when I'm I'm quite close to the author and I speak to the author quite a lot. And there's times when the author, if, so for example, recently a couple of our Dutch authors um, who speak in English very well will edit their own translations to a certain extent. Um, but a lot of the time it's it, the, um, the translator kind of goes between um, the, is the go between between the publisher and the original author. Um, I was speaking to Ian Giles, um, translator from the Swedish, and he says that whenever he reads a book, translates a book, he has he finds a big list of plot holes that he has to he'll go back to the uh, to the original publisher about. So that, there's that kind of thing that, and so that's the kind of thing you can maybe iron out for the for the publisher if you. Although if you although I, like I think I think that. Um... He's not he's not uncontroversial in uh, in taking that approach, so I don't okay. think you know. I think if you if you as a translator feel like there are there are things that you know big issues, big plot holes, and things like that in the original text, then it's very very worth flagging them, and um, you know you might even change them, or you might go back to the original, you know, to the author, or whatever. But it's also worth, um, yeah, flagging them for flagging for the agent that you've done them, rather than just going through and like making the changes yourself without telling anybody. Because oh yeah, yeah, yeah I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I meant that. And I think possibly he was meant in more in the context of when he's he's working with an agent to translate a yeah. book. And I mean, that's another thing we could quickly mention is that a lot more books, especially by Swedish agents, are tending to it tends to be particularly Swedish are getting books translated before they send them on submission. So they can send out an English language manuscript, which lets them get the same kind of buzz for a translated book as you could for an English language. Usually, again, it's usually a thriller. Um, and so it can go at a big auction. And I suppose that's, that could be a good way for translators to get in, so to get in now with, 
with agents who need books, who will often pay up front for the book to be translated, hoping to recoup the cost either because they can sell lots of foreign editions. Um, so the, 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 my one, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to Okay. Again. <laughs> so just my just to anybody who is asked to do that um as a translator make sure that you uh, are happy with the right situation if you're asked to do a full-length translation because um sometimes people have found that they've been asked that they've signed a contract that um doesn't give them any rights beyond um you know they basically just sell sell their work for hire rather than, um, you know, re uh, retaining copyright and so on, which you should, which you should do. And, and, and also it might, it might block you out of the uh, possibility of getting royalties and so on when you find, anyway, it, that's a, mm -hmm. signing contracts is a very big uh, complex area, but it's definitely worth those full length translations. They are being becoming more and more common from Scandinavian languages and, um, you have to be a little bit careful. I think from our perspective, I think we, I think we've always paid royalties whenever we've taken a book on that, um, on that basis. Um, Sophie, could you speak a little bit about your relationship with the authors um, that you've worked with and the publishers as well, please? Yeah, really happily. I, I love this job because I get to work with authors and editors. I think that the editorial process is extremely humbling and just makes you look so much better. It's just wonderful mm -hmm. being edited. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's such a, you know, in, in th there are a few exceptions where you, uh, I think really the, the main exceptions are, are, are essentially where, um, in one instance you can you can have a line edit so that's the first edit that Paul was describing uh, where, where you know sentences will be pulled around or maybe a bit of plot is chopped and moved over here or something um, and sometimes you get uh, you get sent that back and as a translator you just don't feel that that's your remit not like oh I don't have time for this although there is an element of the well, are you paid you know enough mm. to sort of go through in that way and read it in that way but also where you just don't feel that you're able to answer because it, a change has happened to the book and that you you are the guardian of the translate of the translation and the language but you're not really the guardian of how the final book looks so sometimes that can be a bit tricky but you know a lot of this is about diplomacy and negotiation and just being a fellow human being and picking up the phone sometimes I, I can't recommend it highly enough you know and just having a chat with an editor and saying okay we seem to just I just want you to know why I, why I'm not why I want these stats you know why I want these things to stay and that's maybe you could go to the author with them or would you like me to go to the author with them and things like that but that that should be okay if you're able to communicate um, other examples of where things <clears throat> go, can maybe go a little, become a little bit more complicated again, are just really down to tone. It's quite difficult conducting any kind of relationship over, over post-it notes uh, and just different editors have different ways of, of encouraging and drawing things out of you. So you just have to kind of, yeah, you just have, you, you, you live and learn with edits, but you know, you always, uh, you always end up with a better book, um, almost always. <laughs> Um, also knowing when, when that it's okay for you to say step as like the same way as with it when you're actually translating on the page as long as you're able to justify a decision you know intelligently justify why you've gone with this word and not that one um, then it then then really it's your translation it's subjective and sometimes it's okay to, to push back a bit and, and, and argue why why you would like to um, but yeah so edit, being edited is the best thing one of my favorite parts of the job is receiving edits um, and going through them. Uh, I'll just make one co quick comment there is that in terms of as an editor, I feel that I've done my job if I ask the question. My job mm -hmm. is not to impose, is not for the question, is not to get my way. It's that I've asked the question that my concern with the line of text or the sentence has been aired. And if the translator feels differently, then I'm usually just like, fine. Yeah. Now, like, as long as you know that I thought this, then if you want it to be that way, then that's how it's going to be. I think, yeah. I, I think a lot of the time, like when you're translating something, you're reading something with a particular voice in your head, or you might read it aloud as you edit, whatever. But you might not be aware that somebody else might read it in a different way. And that is where the editor is like, 
absolutely invaluable that they can point out to you you know that this particular misunderstanding might uh, might arise or or there is you know a, a different emphasis or something like that and yeah I like I also love I love being edited and, and as you say it's incredibly humbling you're really like did I actually write that is that <laughs> did I think that was English oh gosh so it's uh, not at all then it's something to be <laughs> something to be enjoyed it's yeah. something, like all of you've had very positive experiences of yeah. the yeah. editing process um, and we've got to go to questions in a couple of minutes but I just was also wondering in terms of as publishers and translators how um, how much you've been involved in the process like once the book has been published is that kind of like the end of your involvement the end of your you see your role is coming to an end or have you been previously been involved in the campaigns the publicity like how can translators be useful in terms of spreading the word about a particular book especially if it's books that you've all been you've spoken about quite passionately um whoever wants to go first just jump in so maybe maybe Sophie again actually um, so it, it depends on the book, but um, if the publisher wants to involve you in that stuff and you are able to take the time to do it, then you will benefit from it. Um, I mean, some people argue that, that translators should fight for a royalty on that basis, no, because you have, an, you know, you have a vested interest in, in helping the book also to, to gain a bigger readership because one day you might start earning royalties on it. Um, that's one reason. The other reason is because you usually translate a book, often you will translate a book because you want to share it with people. And so inevitably you've got to the end of the journey of translating it and you want to thrust it into people's hands and say, here you go. And there are ways now to be able to do that as translators. We are more visible in that respect. There are talks in which the translator and author get together and people, you know, the, the translator is understood to be one of the, one of the kind of the co-writer of the book in a way, or certainly the writer of the book in English. So when you're talking about sentences and language, you know, the translator gets asked too. Um, and I think that that's a really healthy place that we've got to. Um, sometimes I think maybe just having a discussion with an editor or a publisher before before that you get to that point to discuss what your role might be and learning when it's okay to say no. You know, if they're like, oh, this the, our author's done this um, interview with an English language journal, but they've done they've answered in French. Can you just translate it for us? And it's like, well, no, no, that takes me a couple of days actually. So no, no, I can't unless you would like to pay me, or are they going to split the author's fee for the interview or whatever? You know. Um, so learning to say those kinds of things, um, yeah, uh, I think, I think translators are, are yeah, fantastic, um, like, uh, kind of assets to the, to the book as a whole. I also think, like, as, um, as a publicist, I really love to kind of use the translator, sorry, that's, so I don't mean it in a kind of exploitative way, but the translator has so much knowledge about that book and they've you know they have a they might have read a lot more of that author's work that hasn't yet been translated um and they've also been you know they've been involved in a process with the author recently we published a book called slash and burn by a salvadoran writer called claudia hernandez and there's a really wonderful uh q a um between the author and the and the translator that was picked up by a um a journal in the US and and published online um about 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 the translation process but put more more you know what what that process meant you know why the book why the book required a particular process or like you know it basically just enabled both of them to kind of get into a really deep interesting discussion about about the book that nobody else could have had that that exact conversation with the author and it's been you know it's been really popular like people have you know lots of people have shared it and read it and commented on it and it's um also often we find that translators have you know they have such a network and they as you say Sophie you know them sharing their excitement and love for the book to their network can really make an impact on sales actually you know because they are able to 
communicate in a way that you know in a different way to the way that we as publishers can communicate they're not marketing the book you know they're sharing their excitement and that comes readers readers understand that in a very different way i think when it comes from a translator at the moment, yeah, still, you still won't find clauses, I think, at the moment. I have never seen one in which it's mm -hmm. asked of you. And in that respect, it's really good because you can say no. You don't have to be that translator either. Yeah. It's not yeah, forever. No, you don't. That's true. Yeah. Um, we've, just got, we've only got five minutes. So I'm going to look at some of the questions on YouTube. I sound like I don't understand technology then. On the YouTube. Um, <laughs> <but we are. laughs> um, someone was asking, actually, about kind of qualifications. What If you think that they're... Um, necessary in terms of if you want to pursue a career in translation, whether you need a degree or um, or anything. I don't have got any answers. Uh, I, I don't have a degree, and I am one. As in, I don't have a translation degree. <laughs> I did do some <laughs> translation. I learned what translation was essentially when I did comparative literature because it was such a present thing in it. But I, I would just very quickly say that for me, the kind of the summer schools, the literary translation focused schools and kind of co coaching areas or mentorships, things like that, with other literary translators, yeah. I think. Not, it's not that I don't I don't know what MAs are like they could be also brilliant but the, but for me it wouldn't be necessary uh, to have the funds or the time to be, to have to do that in order to become a literary translator there are there are other ways summer schools um, being being probably the main one that's an affordable way to do it and I think I think the main the main like benefit of doing an MA is practice and feed you know the feedback that you get. I mean, you know, the theory is great. And like, sometimes it's really interesting to think about translating a text in a theoretical, from a theoretical perspective, but actually I personally haven't, I don't think I have applied a theory, you know, I've never like gone into a translation thinking I'm gonna apply this theory. Um, and I've, I did do some translation theory as part of my PhD, but I didn't, I don't know if I use it on a day-to-day -day basis, but certainly doing an MA is useful for building a network um, and for, you know, getting in contact with people and for being, hopefully, I would hope that an MA would also give you tools to, to develop that network and to establish, you know, like pra practical tools. Um, but you can get those from doing the, you know, the, the BCLT, the British Centre for Literary Translation Summer School or the, Who's doing it currently? The other, the, the one Bristol, that was Bristol Translates. Bristol, Bristol Translates. Yeah. So you know, those are great places to build up um, your expertise, and and some of them have funded places as well. Um, yeah. Well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll gather. Um, we'll yeah gather all the resources that we've mentioned and others that we can find as well and put it on the Comma Press website as well, just as one place where people, I'm sure there's yeah lots of other places that do that, but we can host quite a few. Um, lots of people wondering about if you're, um, so translators that are translating from their native language um, into English, is that, um, is that going to be more difficult for them to find a UK publisher or do you think the kind of, that's, that's starting to change? Because um, I know previously lots of, Lots of funding applications as well used to kind of specify, um, have particular strange guidelines around that. Um, if anyone has any thoughts on that before we close, and then we can round up by saying something very positive. <laughs> I don't think it's, yeah, it, it always was this expectation that you would translate into your mother tongue. Um, but I think that, I, I do think that is changing a bit. And it, it's definitely, I mean, I think in the, for the, and now for UK publishers defunct Creative Europe, European Union applications, it had to be that way or you had to explain why. But I think, I think there is, I mean, I hadn't, it's not that I've given a huge amount of thought to actually, but I had seen things on Twitter about how that is a, a mindset that we need to challenge because it's kind of excluding, it kind of excludes people from their own languages in a weird way. So it's kind of like, yeah, it definitely seems like that's something that will change and needs to change. But I don't think, I mean, if, if, if you read the, if, if you get a text and it's good and it reads well, I don't think any publisher is going to find random reasons to not want to publish your translation. If it, if it works and it's going to, 
reach an audience and sell, then there's no arcane reason why you, you will be rejected, I don't think. And that's and it's the same same that goes with university. You wouldn't look at someone's translation, this is brilliant, then look at their CV and say they haven't got an MA or a degree or uh, I don't know, certificate from Hogwarts and say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna commission these people. So if you can if you can do it, you can do it well, then and you do manage to find the right people who will support you, then I think you can do do it pretty much. That's a great response. Um, so does anyone have any closing words? We've got a minute left just in terms of um, any final top tips that you'd give to the people watching in terms of, yeah, how to push forward. Maybe another another non-thought thought about sector might be the, the cultural institutions, things people like Norla and the Dutch one. And I wonder if a, a good way might be to, uh, in this time where we're kind of sitting at home, reaching out to people over email, it would be a good idea to, because they're always trying to, and they to push their books onto publishers and, and work with translators so maybe that's a good place to start if you yeah. want to start out saying is there anything you're, you you uh, would definitely fund and that is a priority for you and can I do a sample translation or something I don't know how it would work but just kind of that's an area to explore just briefly yeah. say that uh, I would my, my tip would be is if especially if you are translating from languages or a language that is that you think is underrepresented in 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 English in translation, uh, then then yeah I would I'd be extra bold about approaching publishers and just saying I am here to read for in this language uh, and you know do you know anything about these the places where this language is spoken and uh, and the languages of you know the literature of this place uh, if not then you know would you like some information on it because you, you can't the same, really. same goes from writers from from um, minorities from more established languages, I suppose, is, is similar. Um, yeah. um, I think my top tip is just to read, 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 read in your language that you're translating from and the, trans the, the language that you're translating into, because if you have a good awareness of what's out there, then your translation is going to be better, technically, your knowledge is going to be better you know you're going to be more of an expert basically perfect thank you everybody that was brilliant um so thank you paul sophie and nikki um so that's all we've got time for today but we'll have another panel tomorrow on kind of on networking and how you cheesy phrase and i'm sorry survive and thrive as a literary translator so we'll be here again tomorrow at 11 a.m